with me please to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. been reading through Matthew just of late and it's funny sometimes, I mean uh, those of you that preach you might perhaps understand this but you just read a passage and you think to yourself that's why I should preach the weekend <laughs> it's, just, it's just like the Lord says, that's your subject and that's the way it's been so we're going to read from Matthew 13 uh, verse 1 the same day when Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside and great multitudes were gathered together unto him so that he went into a ship and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore he spake many things unto them in parables saying behold a sower went forth to sow and when he sowed some seeds fell by the wayside and the fowls came and devoured them up some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth and when the sun was up they were scorched and because they had no root they withered away and some fell among thorns and the thorns sprung up and choked them but other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit some an hundredfold some sixtyfold some thirtyfold who hath ears to hear let him hear and the disciples came and said unto him why speakest thou unto them in parables he answered and said unto them because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven but to them it is not given for whosoever hath to him shall be given and he shall have more abundance but whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away even that he hath therefore i speak to them in parables because they seeing see not and hearing they hear not neither do they understand and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of isaiah which saith by hearing ye he shall hear and shall not understand and see ye shall see and shall not perceive for this people's heart is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes have they closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them but blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear for verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them hear ye therefore the parable of the sower when any one heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart this is he which received seed by the wayside but he that received the seed into stony places the same is he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiveth it yet hath he not root in himself but dureth for a while and for when tribu tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word by and by he is offended he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful but he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold some sixty some thirty let's just ask the lord's help shall we Let's pray for a moment and eden welcome to join him good Father we would just thank you this morning for this opportunity to gather around the word of God. We thank thee Father God that still in such days as these thou hast here and there an assembly of thy saints who gather together Lord and take pleasure in the word of God. And we ask this morning thy help we pray the touch of the Holy Spirit both upon preacher and upon hearers Lord we pray may we not be hearers only but doers of the word <clears throat> in as much lord as any of us including the speaker may need a challenge this morning we ask that we might be glad to receive it lord that we might be glad of any correction perhaps uh, that our lives are in need of that we might magnify thee and glorify thee that we might know more lord of the abundant life that the lord jesus christ promised and so as we take these a sayings of the saviour lord as we look at this uh, brief teaching that the saviour has given we would pray of thee that the holy ghost might confirm that truth to us this morning 
We pray that the Holy Spirit will take of these things and magnify the Lord Jesus Christ and magnify thy truth. As we thought last night, thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. And we would ask, O God, that this might be done here this morning, that we should go away with a sense that God indeed has spoken to us. Lord, that we might go away with a sense that we've just as it were, touch the hem of the garment of the Lord Jesus Christ and his virtue has flowed into us again. We pray, Lord, thy help then and thy blessing as we consider these things in Jesus' name and for his name's sake, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're in the book of Matthew and uh, possibly one of the most misunderstood books in the churches, I would think, along with portions of Acts and portions of Hebrews. And uh, you know, you don't all agree with me, but you know I'm a dispensationalist. By that I mean that there are certain parts of the scriptures which are for us, and certain parts of the scriptures which are not for us. And uh, we're told, Paul writes to Timothy, I think it's 2 Timothy chapter 2, Study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And you could go to churches this morning, evangelical churches, uh, churches where there's good men perhaps in leadership, and um, you could hear many a good message out of Matthew, but oftentimes there are some key things that I miss. I'm not going to labour those things this morning, but I want to put this passage into its context. The, the gospel of the kingdom is not the gospel that I preach. I do not preach the gospel of the kingdom. I preach the gospel that was taught to Paul after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. A gospel that had to do with how that Christ died. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 was buried and raised again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel I believe and preach. That's not the gospel that during the Lord Jesus earthly ministry that he and the apostles preached. So many men, good men, cannot see this. And yet it is plain as a pike staff if we will only read the New Testament without kind of coming to it with doctrinal prejudices and presuppositions. Uh, I wonder if I can quickly just find a verse that might help to clarify what I'm trying to say here. I'm flying by the seat of my, my pants again. Um, just give me a moment. I've got a note in the margin. I'm sure I have somewhere. In Matthew chapter 16, if you want to look at it, by all means, Matthew chapter 16 um, and verse 21, we read, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. <clears throat> Notice this, from that time forth, Matthew 16, 21, Jesus begins to teach his disciples about his death, burial and resurrection. Then Peter, verse 22, took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Now, if you just go back to Matthew chapter 10, it's not, I imagine there'll be a Bible study this morning, but I want to point out one or two verses. Matthew chapter 10, the disciples are sent out to preach. Verse 5, then these 12, having been listed in the verses previous, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any of the cities of the Samaritans into you not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you've received, freely give. So here in Matthew 10, the disciples are sent out to preach. But not until Matthew, even as late on as Matthew 16, and there is a historical flow here, they never knew what the gospel was that you and I believe, and that we are to, to testify and to preach and to witness. The, the apostles in those early days did not preach the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is my gospel, which is Paul's gospel, which is your gospel, because they never even believed. 
that he was going to go to the cross. What they believed was the Messiah was here. The Messiah has come. The King of Israel is come. The Son of David is come. And he has come to set up his kingdom. They preached the gospel of the kingdom. And you will have to look long and hard. You might get it in some brethren churches. But you will have to look long and hard and go far and wide to find any of this taught in so many of our even sounder churches this morning. It is patently obvious if one will just read through without prejudice what the Bible says that there is a difference between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God, if I might call it that. And so the same applies to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew needs to be set in that kingdom context. Matthew 5, 6 and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, is the King's Manifesto. This is how things will be when the Lord Jesus is here. And it is a law, it is strong law, it's even stronger law than the law of Moses. Men will be dealt with in a moment by the power of God for sin in that kingdom. We're not in the kingdom, we're not in the kingdom of heaven, we are in the kingdom of God, but I can't go there this morning. I'll just mention it and throw this out that the Lord willing, I'm hoping we might have a seminar in October. John Hewitt's going to join me and my son Mike's going to join me. And we're going to look at rightly dividing the word of truth. We, I don't know quite what form that's going to take yet. We might look at things like how simply to study the Bible. We might look at dispensationalism. We might look at the book of Matthew. We might look at the... I don't know. We're going to pray about that together and the three of us, the Lord willing, are going to bring some... Uh, ministry on how to rightly divide the word but Matthew's gospel must be understood in this kingdom context that what the Lord Jesus is preaching and what the apostles are preaching is that the king is here now of course he came to a, sta- he came to a stable he came to a lowly birth the, the scripture leads us to believe he was not a striking, strikingly handsome man to look at of course the saints recognise his beauty as we do today but he didn't cut that superman figure you know that the world looks for as a great leader and the problem that the jews had and the pharisees had was for one thing they would lose their authority if he took power because they knew in their hearts how corrupt they were Um, but he wasn't the kind of man they wanted yes they wanted to throw off the roman yoke yes they wanted to be a great nation again they wanted it but they didn't want this king they didn't want this man to rule over them because he speaks of righteousness all the time and he challenged them so constantly about the rottenness of their hearts you remember in fact i'll just read it to you you can look there if you wish acts chapter one acts and chapter one this is after the resurrection <coughs> the Lord Jesus is about to be taken up into heaven um, just wondering whether it's uh, yes it's verse 6 the disciples have met with the Lord Jesus and in verse 6 Mount of Olives they're on the Mount of Olives when they therefore were come together they asked of him saying lord wilt thou at this time restore the again the kingdom to israel and so many modern preachers will say those poor deceived disciples they, they made lots of mistakes that's true but they were not mistaken here they knew what they meant they expected him to restore and then the lord says no 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 you've got it all wrong the kingdom is spiritual he doesn't say that he simply says it's not for you to know the times and the seasons which the father hath put in his own power and i believe that that kingdom is to come i believe that's what the millennium is all about i believe he's coming i believe israel will be the head of the nations once more and uh, in fact they, they never have been they ought to have been i suppose maybe you might might say so under the reign of solomon but then Israel will be the head of the nations and the knowledge of the glory of the lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea pentecostals use that all the time and there's a measure of truth in that but really it has to do with when the Lord is here the curse is lifted off the earth the devil is chained in the bottomless pit men live as they used to live in patriarchal days for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and the child will die at a hundred we read so there will be death we talked about this last night over food in the kingdom but just to get this Matthew uh, message in its framework we're looking at parables that have to do here in Matthew 13 with the kingdom of heaven 
and the Lord uses this phrase completely, uh, com- com- um, frequently in the chapter, the kingdom of heaven. Nevertheless, wisdom and carefulness is needed when handling this book because there's much in Matthew that we sometimes call, you might not have heard this word before, transdispensational truth. There's much in Matthew of a moral sort that has application to the church. And when Paul lines up with Jesus, that's for you. And although what the Lord is talking about here is the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom and the responses to the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom, I am quite sure that the same responses are found today to the message that we preach. So it's it's a passage spiritually that is every bit as relevant today to us as it was to the disciples when the Lord Jesus taught it to them. Um, and so we can, we can take this. This is, this is a letter you can open, as Herbert Rose used to say. Uh, and we can, we can say, well, what are the lessons here for us? Um, I'll just plug Matt's book here. Matt's got a book online, Living in Christ. And Matt touches on this subject here, how the, what a parable is for. You know, you'll hear so often in the church is a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. A parable is meant to give you teaching. Well, if you read what the Lord says, a parable is to teach truth to some and to hide it from others. That's the point of a parable. Give not that which is holy to the dogs. God doesn't give all his truth to everybody. You have to want it. You have to hunger and thirst for it. Even we believers, you've got to hunger and thirst if you want to be taught the word of God. And that's why there's so much that I still don't understand. I'm probably not hungry enough. I'm not thirsty enough. I'm not meditating in the word of God as much as I ought to do. But I promise you, you do that. You mean business and God will just blow your mind with the wonderful things in the Bible. As he has me and and I'm sure you've experienced from time to time. So we can take these four conditions of the soil for ourselves this morning. And... um, first thing I should say also is that don't make the mistake of thinking 25% will accept the gospel 25% will give up after persecution it doesn't say anything about percentages it's just talking about responses you know of the, of the nations of the world there are infinitely less than 25% who have believed the gospel this morning we hear figures sometimes you know that there are so many Christians in England well nobody really knows that's the first thing you know, you can, if, if, you, if you, they, they include people like the Anglicans, well, you, for the most part, you can forget about the Anglicans. They don't know whether they're coming or going. I mean, you might talk to Matt about some of the letters he's had from Anglican bishops. They really don't know whether they're coming or going. As a, um, Rookman says they're as blind as a bat coming in backwards. So there's so many churches that profess to be Christian, but they're not really Christians at all. So to put a figure on it, is very very difficult the important thing is do you know you're the Lord's this morning that's the important thing and what we're reading about here as as is perhaps obvious to you is four responses to the gospel another prefatory word if I might the sower soweth the word this is a great encouragement to me to be involved in evangelistic work. I don't do it nearly as much as I ought to do. I'm certainly not very good at it, but oftentimes I'm so blessed at the encouragement in the scripture that we should be sowing the word. And it's the seed, Peter says, by which the incorruptible seed by which you're born again. And the way men and women are one to Christ is not because they see how wonderful you are, and not because they see how wonderful I am, not because of our lovely sweet smiles. That's not principally what brings them to Jesus. The Bible tells me what brings them to Jesus is the word of God. You're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. That's what we need to be ministering if you want to win souls. Not having knees ups in the church on a Sunday morning, not going out in the street, you know, doing some Christian rap. We need to be ministering the word of God. We need to be preaching the word of God. We need to be giving the word of God to our friends and our neighbours as the Lord helps us. The sower soweth the word. The responses here were responses to the word of God. That's what the seed is. And it's an encouragement to me to sow the seed. We keep some tracks under here. Not many here at the moment. There's a few left. I don't know whether we'll take any out this morning. We might do. But this has got the word of God. And this is a seed. The word of God is a seed. And I believe in giving people the word of God. 
and just trusting the Lord to work with it, to water it, to make it grow. Nevertheless, you can do that faithfully and not see much fruit. Sean will tell you, Mimi will tell you, you know, almost every Sunday. Perhaps he doesn't need to tell you, perhaps you know this for yourself. The gospel is not very popular these days. And the word of God is not very popular these days. And you can give it as plain as plain can be and people will still be as blind as a bat and walk away. It's a heart problem. Don't let them persuade you that it's not clever enough. It's a heart problem. They don't want to hear the gospel. It's not that they can't believe it. They won't believe it. And they won't believe it because they have their own plans they have their own lives mapped out and they don't want some preacher telling them or some Bible telling them or some God telling them you don't want to do that, that's sinful. And that's why it's refused. Some of the atheists will try and tell you, you know, it's because you're not very bright. Well, we might not be very bright, but that's not the point. You know, they try to make out like we're not very persuasive, but the problem is they just don't want it. That's the problem. So we have these four types of ground then. We saw... Um, First of all, some fell upon stony places. And the Lord Jesus says in verse 19, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. And I fear that this is the problem with most people now. It used to be you could go out on the street, and certainly a hundred years ago, you, I, I remember George Williams... Uh, we're sort of distantly related to George Williams and his I think it's his great niece was telling us that he used to go out and preach they used to throw bricks at him and he'd stand there preaching while the blood run down into his shoes he'd carry on preaching you know read about Wesley read about the stuff that Wesley had thrown at him read about the stuff you can go out and preach now and you, in the street now and you can preach your heart out and they don't bat an eyelid they don't turn a hair they just carry on about their business I've been out in the street preaching my lungs out and I've had two women sitting here talking about shopping about six feet away I'm preaching for all I'm worth about hellfire and damnation and the love of Christ and she's saying you know how much the potatoes are I tell you you know, people these days are so hard hearted and so thick skinned you ought not to be surprised if they don't receive the word of God and that's the problem with the stony hearted hearer he just doesn't receive it at all sometimes I think you know we might get a message in the morning for many of the preachers and it might be absolutely what we needed what we what we all needed and it just might be on that particular day the Lord has really touched us and wants to speak to our hearts and sometimes when the preacher says amen we're up we've got the kettle going I'm not saying we shouldn't have a cup of tea but it's all forgotten in a moment and maybe sometimes we should just sit still if the Lord has spoken to us and say Lord don't let this be taken away I need I need to take this home, I need to take it to heart, I need to meditate on these things. We're always in too much of a hurry, aren't we? Even in church sometimes. Perhaps not so much here, but you know, it's possible. So the Lord says in verse 20, He that receives seed into the stony place is the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it, yet he hath no root in himself. Oh sorry, this is the second, this is the second man, isn't it? Stony places. The same is he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiving it. So you, you do get some people that say, wow, what a message. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And they're like fireworks for a little while. Might be, might be even for years. They're keen. But what does the Lord say? Yet he hath not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he's offended he never really understood what it means to believe the gospel he never really understood how unpopular the truth is he never really understood what kind of flat he's going to get for becoming a Christian whether he did become a Christian is questionable in this case I had you know a number of friends when I first got saved there were two men that both profess Christ at the same time as I did. One of those is now a practicing sodomite and has been a practicing sodomite to my knowledge for many, many years. The other one, he had he married a lady, a young girl from the church. She was a missionary's daughter, and um, they had four kids. 
he was keen for a while but then his son had a motorcycle accident and and he said to me I'm not a Christian anymore I said why is that he says because God doesn't answer my prayers when tribulation or persecution arises by and by he's offended there's no promise and I wish it was otherwise I wish I could tell you otherwise for my own sake I wish I could tell you otherwise but there's no promise brothers and sisters it's going to be an easy road there's no promise of that at all in fact the more resolved you are to stand up for the Lord the more they're going to throw rocks at you count on it and this is Bible teaching it's not you know they won't, again they won't teach you to the churches what they want of all that is bottoms on seats let's get them in with some Moses let's get them in with the Christian communion of all things they want bottoms on seats and they won't warn people who profess Christ who may perhaps really have found the Lord of the trouble that they can expect if they're determined to mean business. Uh, you know, I often, I often remember that some of the things that Herbert Rowe says because they were incited. I listened to him for many years and often these things would come back to me. And I remember him saying once to the folks in his church, where are the 40 men, my brother, who have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they've taken your life? And Herb says, I'm not where I should be. I'm not testifying. I'm not standing up for the... Because I'm not getting any flack. <laughs> he did, actually. His life was threatened on more than one occasion by churches, would you believe, that he was due to go to preach to um, because they couldn't stand the gospel that he preached. And it's a challenge to me. Generally speaking, I have a pretty charmed and easy life, generally speaking. They're, you know, you might not think it, or maybe you would, but you know, generally speaking, in Dudley, they're quite nice. When you've got the town, you know, that you get somebody coming towards you with rings through everything and bees through everything, and he's air sticking up six feet, and he'll say, "All right, my mate, think yourself. I can't believe this. You think he's going to cut your throat? You say, "All right, my mate, I'm one of those." But it's not always like it is in. But even in Dudley, you'll get some people that will be scornful, especially if you start to preach. So this is something to be aware of then. What, did, what was it? I'm just trying to remember Paul's words to Timothy um, about he that liveth godly shall suffer persecution. He doesn't say he might do, he says he shall do. And what, what, it's not because he professes to be a Christian, it's because he lives godly. That's what really cuts people up. That's why they hated Jesus, because his life was so pure that when they came near him they could see the rottenness that was, he's like a mirror if you will and when they came near Jesus they could see how rotten they were and they hated him for that put that light out stop, I don't want to see that anymore because he makes me feel bad they wouldn't admit to that but that was the trouble so we have those that reject it very very quickly we have those that seem perhaps to become Christians they make a profession they're excited for a while you know what does the Lord say here yet he hath not rooted himself but dureth for a while you know that could be 10 years if ye continue in my word then are ye my disciples indeed and I can, I'll tell you I can only thank God it's by his grace I professed Christ when I was 26 and that's been years a long time ago and I, can, I have to say was it Joshua hitherto hath the Lord helped me if we go on we go on because God is good and God is gracious and God is forgiving and you know I wouldn't swap what I've got for all the tea in China this Roman Catholic guy I've been corresponding with he's got about as much chance of I don't know what as, as getting me to become a Catholic he's got no hope he's got, he's got no gospel he's got no joy he's got no message all he's got is that dopey bloke that boozer over in Italy uh, with a white frock on that gets carried around everywhere thinks I'm going to follow him he's got no chance I had a woman I've told you before uh, uh, one of my pupils Asian woman Asia lovely lady uh, in her 30s I guess she wasn't too good a driver it was a bit like me that's up in towers uh, but she, she said to me on one occasion I'd love to win you for Islam I thought to myself you pigs will fly first do you think what I'd swap? Do you think I would swap the grace that I've got for the message, that miserable message of law that you've got? If you're a Christian this morning, you've got something very, very precious. So precious that if you're really the Lord, you'll go through fire and water. I've been reading about uh, the reformers. In 1555, Mary came to the throne 
and started burning all the men of God in the country. And you should read those stories. You think they're horrible. You read those stories. Some of them, those men, it says they went to that site like they were going to their weddings. And, you know, so moved, after moved me to tears, it almost get me to tears even thinking about some of those great stories of those men. Latimer and Ridley being burned back to back. John Bradford, John Hooper, so many of them in 1555 through 58 who went without flinching to be burned. Cranmer had a bit of a problem. Cranmer was persuaded through fear of the flames to recant but in the end he changed his mind and in the flames he held his hand out and said this hand that signed the deed this will go first. And the folks, there were great crowds there. Mary shot herself in the foot. The Roman Catholics shot themselves in the foot because those martyrs went to those stakes like they were going so many of them to weddings. Some of them actually said, I feel nothing. I feel nothing. It's like a bed of roses from the flames, they would say. And I'm sure that many, many, many people were converted. That's Christianity. I mentioned it recently, didn't I? Was it last Sunday? I can't remember when I preached last, when I touched on this anyway. Um, you know, that, that if you've really got something precious, you, you, you're prepared to stand for it. And we need to be prepared. Again, it's always God's grace. Any of us could fall over. Any of us, we all have moments of weakness. But I wouldn't give up what I've got for all the tea in China. So that's the second person. There's joy for a while. With joy receiving it, but persecution, tribulation comes. He's offended. And of course, he goes away. The third character is he also, verse 22, that receives seed among the thorns. Is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. The Lord expects us to be fruitful. The fruit is described in Galatians chapter 5, 22. Love, joy, peace and so forth. That's the fruit that he's looking for. In John's Gospel chapter 15, the Lord says, I am the vine. And he talks about how that God prunes the vine that it might bring forth more fruit. And, uh, you know, we need to be, it's only as we are in subjection to the word of God, we are willing to be pruned. We don't kick at the gardener. We don't kick at the pruning. We say, Lord, have thy will, that we are going to start to show that fruit. And it's the fruit that wins people. Maybe not many. And even if it doesn't, you've got the fruit. It's a great, it's a wonderful thing to, to know that fruit, the fruit of the Holy Ghost working in us. And yet what happens here, the deceitfulness of riches, the care of this word, world, choke the word. And we need to be so careful about just wanting to settle down and be comfortable here. We need to be so careful about coveting our neighbour's BMW. You know, I, I still do it. You know, there's some big houses near. Oh, we don't live in one, but not far from where I live, there are some big houses, you know. And I'll have to walk past, or we were over in uh, Knoll. Uh, the houses are so big over there, it's untrue. And, and Gene said, well, Gene said to me, you know, uh, I can't remember quite what you said now. You know, you've got to clean them for a start. You know, you've got 12 bedrooms, that's okay. You've got, you've got some maids, you've got to clean them. Um, I remember her, I remember. Um, Sue so Baker saying, you can only wear one suit at a time. You know, was it, was it Imelda Marcos? got a wardrobe full of shoes, but you can only wear one pair of shoes at a time. And yet, you know, we can be overtaken by covetousness. And it chokes the word. That's the point. It chokes the word. And it wastes our time. I wonder how many of us, and I'm not being critical here at all, and I, you know, I've no idea what it might apply to me. If we were wholehearted to the Lord, would be in the employment million at the moment. Or whether we might have said to the Lord five years ago, Lord, I want to, I want to do some prison work, or I want to do some hospital work, or I want to do this. You know, sometimes the consideration is what's the bottom line financially? We, even Christians, you know, the Lord's blessed me, I've got such and such a job, and I'm earning 25k. It takes me three years to earn that. <laughs> Perhaps not quite. Um, what we should be doing is saying, what does the Lord want me to do? That's where the joy is. That's really where the joy is. That's where people are really influential when all they care about. And there's re Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And I've said to you before, he didn't say more abundantly. He said more abundantly. And the more we are resolved that we are going to 
not be deceived by riches. We're not going to get choked by the cares of, cares of this world. The more we're going to have joy, the more we're going to find the purpose for which we were made. And that's the joy of being a Christian. You are discovering what God made you for. Um, Jean and Caroline, I don't know whether anybody else went with you, went to uh, Rome a while back and Jean was talking about the, the Michelangelo's carving of David. He said, it's amazing to look at. <coughs> Now, of course, he just took a block of stone, wouldn't he? And he got in his mind what he wants, and he chips away and chips away until David begins to appear. And, uh, you know, that's what, in a sense, God has to do with us. He takes this rough block, doesn't he? Um, Julius says, I think, you blocks, you stones, you're worse than senseless things. He takes this rough block, and God knows that that's got to go. I'm going to chip this bar for you. And, and he's got this picture in mind all the time of the man or the woman he created you to be. There's no hope we're ever going to be that unless we're born again. You're wasting your time, you're wasting your life if you're not born again. But once you get born again, and sometimes that chisel hurts, sometimes that pruning fork hurts, but God is working with us. You know, we think so much about what we're going to do for God and we forget too often about what God wants to do in us, what God wants to do to us. Because God can only do something with us when he's done something in us and he will change us and so this is another great problem the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches but verse 23 he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold some sixty some thirty that tells me that we're all not going to be equally productive for one thing uh, it might be even in the will of God that if we were absolutely all of us committed to the will of God that some would bring forth 30 and some 60 and some 100 it might be that if we were all absolutely committed to the will of God we'd all bring forth a hundredfold I don't know we read this about Jacob don't we, we read about Isaac they brought forth a hundredfold and people saw that how their flocks grew and they saw that the Lord had prospered them and I think there are people that will see it in you and they'll see it in me They'll say to themselves that the Lord's hand seems, there's something about this woman, there's something about this man. The things they do seem to prosper. I wonder if there's any truth in this God, this Jesus he believes in. And so fruit is the subject here again. He that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Some of the people that call themselves Christians these days, you know, you just, you just can't get your hat on, can you? With the way they behave, they're not afraid to lie, they're not afraid to get drunk, they're not afraid to fornicate. They're just, you know, they're not Christians. Surely they're not Christians. How could they possibly so constantly behave so badly if ever they do the Lord? And if they are, they've got a shock coming at the judgment seat of Christ. And can I just finish with this with regard to fruit? we will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. If you're the Lord, if you're not the Lord this morning, you're going to stand at the great white throne and you're going to be sent to hell from the great white throne and your works are going to be considered. But if you're the Lord this morning, you're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ, which could be very soon. And we will, re we will be rewarded there for the works that we have done for the Lord. We might sometimes kid ourselves, we're doing a thing for the Lord, but actually it's for our own aggrandizement, it's for our own name and for our own sake. But if we genuinely do, and I'm often exercised about this, if we genuinely do, genuinely do what we do for the Lord, there will be rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. And there it will be clear who has served the Lord and who has only named the Lord. We read of those who are saved, yet so as by fire. They're saved. I've had to tell this Roman Catholic guy this, you know, that there's two separate judgments. He ain't got a clue. Two separate judgments. The white throne is for lost people, and the, the judgment seat, the beamer, is for the saved. But we need to keep this in mind. We are going to be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ for what we have done, and lots of rewards for what we have felt. Does I mean we're going to be lost? If you go to the judgment seat of Christ, you're a saved person. But what we did for the Lord will there be rewarded and there there will also be losses. And I think that will affect eternity. Personally, I think it has to do with where we are with God for all eternity to come. 
So it's, it's a serious matter. But perhaps I could leave you with this. The sower soweth the word. And let's beware that we're not the wrong kind of hearer. Amen. <laughs>